you. Um, for those in the audience, I'm actually a fish out of water here because I'm a, a medical practitioner, background in occupational medicine, um, and I've spent 50, no, 25 out of my 33 years in clinical practice supporting workers and people li who live in remote environments receive healthcare. So I thought I'd bring some of the ideas that have been used in mainstream healthcare technology today to see how they might apply to the maritime industry. But the first question I asked myself was, well, is there a problem? So I did a bit of research to see how often medical emergencies actually occur at sea. So the first bit of research from, some, uh, from Germany in 2014 <coughs> revealed that over a quarter of medical officers who receive medical training have been in, involved in a serious medical incident. Then looked at a workshop by the International Maritime Health Association in 2015, and they estimated that a serious medical incident occurred on board a vessel every two years. So the third bit of research looked at was another publication in a maritime journal in 2013, and they estimated that one in, and they did a study of 23, just over 23,000 vessels, 400,000 crew members, and they found that one in five ships diverted for medical reasons every year. And that cost to that particular industry segment was nearly $170 million. So what did I find? Medical emergencies happen at sea more often than I thought. So please don't bury your head in the sand over the next few minutes. Pay attention, listen, um, and I hope I can share some examples with you that might help you save money, but more importantly, save a life. So when I was thinking about how to frame my talk, uh, we had a rather unfortunate incident. One of the uh, aspects of our business is we provide health professionals who work on vessels who uh, work in the oil and gas industry. So we had a paramedic on board a vessel offshore Norway, and that vessel received a distress call from a nearby vessel. A 68-year-old seafarer had collapsed earlier that day. He'd been unwell, sent to the cabin. When they went to check on him, he was found collapsed. Fortunately, our vessel responded and was able to get my paramedic on board within 40 minutes after the initial collapse. What he found there was concerning. The sh chief officer and the captain were trying to do resuscitation, but they weren't following the standard teaching practice in the protocols for adult life support of using cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. They didn't have an AED, an automated external defibrillator present. Um, my paramedic got involved, took charge. Unfortunately, there was a tragic outcome and that seafarer died. During that in resuscitation, he also found that this particular seafarer had had a strong history of, uh, had had previous cardiac uh, disease and was on medication for angina, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do is use these four areas here to frame the talk today that I hope will provide you with some insights. So the first is the use of video conferencing technology. The ability to reach people like myself face to face is getting harder and harder in healthcare systems. Trying to deliver that in a remote setting is getting harder and harder. 2014, it was estimated that globally about just under 20 million consultations took place between a healthcare professional and patient. 2018, that figure is looking to be near 170 million consultations. Mainstream healthcare is adopting this method of using uh, video conferencing to provide medical support. I'm not talking about expensive equipment. They're using simple devices, smart devices like phones, tablets, can help uh, deliver this medication, uh, sorry, intervention. Not only for medical emergencies, but it could be used to provide chronic disease management, of which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Um, but I think when you think about the, the cost of the industry for medical diversions, that industry, when I said later, hundred, earlier, 170 million, if you translate that across the whole maritime fleet, every year it could be in the region of $750 million, this particular paper estimated, that was due to medical diversions. So implementing access to clinicians could help. The second area I'd like to think, talk about is electronic medical record system. This is a systemized, systemized way of keeping data, health data, about a patient. Uh, 
providing seafarers with access to an electronic medical record system that's cloud-based so they can access it anywhere there's an internet and providing access to clinicians who interact with them, whether that be their doctor at home, whether it be the doctor who they might see during a port call, whether it might be the results of their uh, seafarers medical or their PME examination, whether it might be the interventions by the medical officer in charge whilst they're on board. If they were all loaded onto the electronic medical system, if you think about the situation that I described earlier, if a video conference had been held when that seafarer first became unwell, if that TMAS doctor had been able to go in, see that this person had a history of cardiac disease, see the medication they're on, they might well have anticipated what the likely uh, cause of the condition was and been able to respond earlier. <coughs> Which brings me on to the next area that we might be able to use technology, re providing refresher training. Health professionals have to go through regular clinical skill training on a frequent basis. But how do we retain those skills? Not very well. Studies from health professionals who've been through their advanced life support training show that they lose this information maybe six months to a year after training. A study from first responders who were trained um, in the basic life support who when tested one year later in a simulated cardiac arrest weren't able to give an adequate level of response. And I think the response that we saw on board a vessel supports that fact. Um, finally, providing frequent refresher training to non lay people does help them retain these basic skills of CPR and AED and providing that on a regular basis. So this critical skill decay, uh, decay is very important. We face this challenge in the business that I'm in for many years. How do we improve and uh, meet this challenge? Well, there's ways that you can do it. An example in Scotland, they have a lot of doctors who work in all over Scotland who work to support the ambulance service and providing pre-hospital emergency medical care. Those doctors don't have many incidents, but they need to be kept up to date with their critical clinical skills. Using live video conferencing through simulated uh, scenarios enables that doctor to keep up to, state, uh, up to date in the comfort of their room, home, uh, in their kitchen, wherever they are, by a trainer led uh, remotely providing that update. Could you use that in this industry? Potentially, when vessels are in ports, but you could also use um, e-learning platforms with video assisted tutorials. Because I think the one thing that I found is that medical officers on charge do their mandatory training every five years, and that period just isn't sufficient for them to retain their skills when they really need them. The final area that I'd like to talk about, so I've talked a lot about um, <coughs> reaction, so let's look at the prevented area. So these things, these wearable devices, Fitbits, whatever. Um, that market is going crazy. 2016, 300 million wearable devices were on the market. And then by 2020, 830 million devices are probably going to be sold. So that's nearly one in seven people on the planet are going to have one of these devices. The most interesting thing is the application of these devices. They're not going to be fitness driven. They're going to collect health data. So they're going to be able to collect and monitor people's heart rate, monitor people's blood pressure, maybe monitor people's blood sugar. In fact, there's one a leading manufacturer who's named after a particular type of fruit that already has a wearable device that can re uh, record a heart rhythm, send an ECG or an EKG to a remote provider. So this this is going to transform healthcare. How providers are going to keep up with this, how we're going to meet this challenge, it's going to be interesting because these devices are going to generate clinical data that doctors can use to provide and manage people remotely. The Why do we need to worry about this? Well, we heard earlier um, about tsunamis affecting the industry. The tsunami that has affected the health business is our lifestyle diseases. Since 2015, the number one killer 
globally has been cardiovascular disease. So that's diseases like high blood pressure, coronary artery, coronary artery disease, and stroke. <coughs> that picture isn't going to change in the near future. So using these devices with selected apps, there are over a quarter of a million medical apps available on the App Store. Now, some of those apps are good, some of them aren't, but you need to get the quality apps. But if you get quality apps with a wearable device, even with the fitness tracking at the moment, you can see here how the results can help improve the health and wellness. So if you're looking after your crew health and wellness management, putting a device uh, with an application on could help you reduce some of your costs because your crew are going to be suffering the same incidence of heart disease that people on land suffer. There is no difference. The studies have been done and crew members show that they have the same level of interventions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in summary, I think there is an opportunity for the maritime industry to take up some of this technology. It's not expensive. We're not talking about bringing in big telemedical boxes that were in the industry when I started many years ago. Um, but bringing in this interventions could help you um, provide better access to healthcare for your seafarers, according to the Maritime Labour Convention. It could help you minimise your losses in the long term through managing their chronic diseases, which they're going to have on board whether you like it or not because the population of the world has these chronic diseases. And if you don't treat them when they're on board adequately, they're going to cause you unnecessary medical diversions, which costs money. But most importantly, the main area of this is that using some of this technology could help save a life. So thank you for your attention today.